All this new technology is a new thing for me. I'm not used to wiring up and having all this technology. I feel like I'm, uh, if I get too excited, it may explode this morning. So hopefully that doesn't happen. I want to begin, as always, by saying good morning, church family. So very thankful that you have chosen to be with us today and to once again study from God's Holy Word. If you're visiting with us, I want to say thank you for coming our way. You are our honored guest, and if there's anything we can do to help assist your visit, please let us know how we can help. I would like to take your attention in your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, in particular verse number 3. There is a passage here that has always caught my attention, a passage that has always stood out to me, a passage that has always brought me a great deal of comfort and hope. And the passage that, that I'm speaking of is here in Ephesians 1 and verse number 3. And there the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now that's a passage that if you've attended church for any length of time, then brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, you've probably heard that verse read. You've probably heard that verse quoted, and I want us to take a, a slightly closer look at it, and I want you to tell me what the verse says. The Bible says again, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some spiritual blessings. Is that what your Bible says? It says it has blessed us with most spiritual blessings. Straighten me out, church family. Every or all spiritual blessings. And then we go on to read where all spiritual blessings are located. He says, has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places which are in who? They are in Christ. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about being in Christ. I want to talk about the blessings that are only found in Jesus Christ. This, this most of the time is the approach I take in personal one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. I often start out by getting to know the person. Oftentimes the first study that I have with someone, I would say 75 or more percent of that first study is really just a getting to know their story, getting to know who they are, getting to know what their background is, getting to know what their religious beliefs are. And often by the end of getting to know that person, I will simply take out a sheet of paper and I will say, or I will ask, do you mind reading the words found in Ephesians 1 and verse number three and they will read the words that we just emphasized and then what I will do is I will ask them of course before this happens I will ask them to be very clear about what they believe here's the reality in our community there is various churches and denominations isn't that right and as we look at the various church buildings, we will see they, are, they have different names and they have different beliefs. And you know this, this is no surprise to you, that, that most of the time there will even be a different plan of salvation. There are some churches, like the one I grew up in, that says that if you want to become a Christian, you come forward, you kneel at the altar, you pray and you ask the Lord to come into your heart. And there, in that very moment, in that prayer, you've been a Christian, whether you've repented or not whether you've confessed or not, whether you've been baptized or not. And so that's one plan of salvation. Another plan of salvation that we often see represented in the religious world is when someone says, come forward and be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Speak in tongues and have some sign that God has placed His stamp of approval upon you. And there's, there's the truth of you becoming a Christian there's other beliefs out there, of course. Some say all you got to do is believe. Some say you've got to believe plus repent. Some people say all you need to do is believe and confess. You know, I'm not interested in all that. I'm interested in what the Bible says. And here's what I know for certain, that if I want the spiritual blessings that God's Word promises me, they're not found in man-made churches, they're not found in man-made religion, they're not found in the traditions of men, even in the traditions of the churches of Christ, they're found in the inspired, infallible, inerrant truth called God's Word. Actually, according to God's Word in Ephesians 1 and verse number 3, all spiritual blessings are found in one one location, and that is in Christ Jesus. Now, let's say that you had a rich relative that you did not know of, 
And one day you get a call and, and it's legitimate and everything checks out and here's what you hear on the other end of that phone. You hear that you actually had an aunt or an uncle, a great aunt or a great uncle that you never knew about. And they live so many states away and they're rich and they're wealthy and they've passed away and they want to give you a whole lot of money. Well, let me ask you, church family, is that going to catch your attention? I think it would for most of us. And you say, well, what do I need to do that I may come in possession of all of this wealth? Well, they tell you, you need to be at this location at this time, and you need to be in this exact room. And if you're there and can prove your identity, and you sign the dotted line, then, then all of these millions of dollars, and all of this gold, and all of these blessings, and all of these precious jewels, they're all yours. Question, whether we view ourselves as materialistic or not, aren't most of us going to at least investigate that? Brothers and sisters, we are told in God's Word, not regarding earthly wealth, not regarding physical blessings alone, but regarding verse number 3, the spiritual blessings and every spiritual blessing that God could bestow upon us, every spiritual blessing that God could possibly give us, it is all found in one location. And may I point to the screen and say, brothers and sisters, where are all spiritual blessings found? They're found in Christ. And so with that under consideration, I want us to... Th this shows the simplicity of, and the extent of my artwork. It isn't very great. But here's a circle. And what I want to do for the next few moments is consider some. We can only barely touch the blessings that God has bestowed upon those who are in Christ... But I would like to begin, begin here in this passage and look at just a sampling of some of those blessings that we have in Christ. The first one can be found in Ephesians 1 and verse number 7. And there the Bible says, In Him. In who? In Christ. In Christ we have... What's it say, church family? We have redemption. Now I know that's a religious word, I know that's a church word that oftentimes we're only using on Sunday mornings and Wednesdays when we come together, but that is a word that means something. He says, in Him, in Christ, we have redemption, underline it, through His blood. In Christ, we have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Now, first and foremost, let me just define this word redemption. Redemption has tied to a financial understanding. The idea is that, that I used to own something. It is no longer in my possession, but I make the payment necessary to buy it back. And when I'm studying with people, on one occasion when we were in Panama studying, I asked a lady, I said, tell me, if you, give me an example of what redemption is that, that tells me you understand this word. And she says, there's a cabinet over here. It was in her kitchen. She said, this cabinet has been passed down to me from my grandmother, and it was passed down from her grandmother, and some years ago, and it's precious to me and my family. It doesn't hold a whole lot of value to most people, but to me and my family, it means something because it's sentimental. And, and she would go on to explain that some years ago, she found herself in, in financial hardships, and, and she didn't have anything left to sell, but someone came along and wanted to buy that cabinet it there in her kitchen. She didn't want to sell it. She didn't want to get rid of it. But she was desperate and to feed her family, she thought, if I have to sell it, I will. And so she sold it. And since in the years since she sold it, she missed it and she regretted that decision. And she wished she could relocate it and buy it back. And sometime later she told the story how that someone knew of a person who she believed owned the cabinet that had been in her family for years. And she approached that person, realized this was true, and said, I want to buy it back. How much do I need to buy it back for? And, and they gave her a price that was way above the money she had previously made from it. Do you think that lady did everything in her power to get that cabinet back? She most certainly did because it meant something to her. 
And of course, the spiritual application is there. That is, that when, when we were created, we're created, made in the image of God. We have breathed into us the breath of life. We are in fellowship with God. We are the children of God. And when we're born, that is the case. And when we grow to the age of accountability and we choose to rebel against God and sin, we put a, we put a barrier between us and God. Isaiah 59 verse 2, that our sins have separated us from God. And God says, they used to belong to me. They used to be my child. They're no longer my child, but I so desperately want them to be my children again. Therefore, I'm going to pay the ultimate price. I'm going to give my only begotten son, Jesus, and I'm going to give him as a ransom that they may receive redemption and that I may buy them back from the devil. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, when I'm reminded that I've sinned against God, Romans 3.23, and I'm reminded that my sins bear the consequence of eternal destruction and death, I realize in that moment that there's nothing, there is nothing I need more than the redemption that Jesus Christ offers. And where is that redemption found? It is found only in Christ Jesus. If I try to live this life without Jesus in my life, I'm failing miserably. If I try to be religious without Jesus being at the center of everything I do, I'm failing. If I try to make it to heaven by the doctrines of men or the churches that are man-made or by plans of salvation that are not found in the Bible, then I'm going to fail every time because the only way I can be bought back from Satan, the only way I can be bought out of the bondage of sin and be given freedom in Christ Jesus is if I am where the blessing is located and that's only in Christ Jesus. He goes on to use another word in verse number 7. I didn't put it on the screen because I could only fit so much in this little circle. But in Ephesians 1 and verse number 7, in Him... What's it say? In Christ we have redemption. By the way, that redemption is found where? In Christ, but particularly it's the result of Jesus shedding His blood. We sing a song sometimes, don't we? What can wash away my sins? What's the answer? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. He says, in Christ we have redemption, verse number 7. In Christ we have the forgiveness of sins, that is, my slate has been wiped clean, my record has been wiped clean, all of that sin debt that I have accumulated, that I owe the consequences thereof, it is wiped clean because I have chosen to be in Christ. Let's look at another one. Go with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. And again, we can only look at a very few of these, and I could have listed any number of blessings because there's so many. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1, there is a, another statement made, and another blessing that I realize is located only in Christ. And that blessing, according to 2 Timothy 2, 1, is this. He says, You therefore, my beloved son... Be strong in the underline it grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, in, a, in the religious world, we like to talk about this word grace, don't we? We like to talk about the concept of grace. And by the way, there are two extremes in modern religion as far as I can tell regarding grace. One is when churches want to emphasize works and never emphasize grace. And the other extreme is when someone wants to emphasize only grace and not emphasize works at all. But we understand in God's Word that faith and works go hand in hand. And, and certainly we can say that grace and works go hand in hand. Grace is, is God's unmerited favor and gift. That is God extending a gift unto us that none of us truly deserve. Someone once said that grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And certainly spelling out the word grace, that is true. And so the idea of grace brings to mind, for me, the cross. 
it brings to mind that there was a man who was sent from heaven above. And how that that man came to this earth and he lived a life sinless, according to the Hebrews writer. And as he walked here upon this earth, he did not make it his earthly agenda to, to, to indulge in pleasure or fame and popularity and riches, but rather, as he would say at a young age of twelve, I have come that I may do the business of my father. And later he would say that I have come that I may seek and save he who is lost. Jesus came to earth with a heavenly mission. And his mission was to bleed and die on the cross of Calvary that I may have grace freely extended unto me. And yet while he was on this earth, he was in the garden simply trying to pray, knowing full well what was coming. And as he was there in the garden, his closest of friends in that dark hour could not even stay awake with him and pray with him. And one of his close friends, Judas Iscariot, came into the garden with an angry mob in the middle of the night. That was illegal. And with the sign of a kiss on the cheek, he betrays our Lord. In the Greek language, the word kiss, in reference to Judas Iscariot, signifying this one is the one you arrest. And he kissed Jesus, his good friend, on the cheek. That is the word phileo, which is brotherly love. He had an outward sign of brotherly love that resulted in an inward sign of hate. And in the long run, it was outwardly shown. And brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was illegally taken at night. He was drugged to Caiaphas and then to Pilate and back to Caiaphas and back to Pilate. And Pilate freely admitted, I see no fault in this man. What do you want me to do with him? And the crowds chanted, Crucify him. Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Pilate seemed like he couldn't understand such a demand. Well, here at this feast day, you know it is our custom, Pilate would announce, that we would release a prisoner unto you. I have two men you, the crowd, can choose. I have Barabbas, who is a violent murderer, and I have this man, Jesus, who I'm telling you has done nothing wrong. And what did the crowd demand? Release Barabbas. Our hearts are so filled with hate toward this innocent man who came to die and love the lost of everyone in this whole world that we're so full of hate we'd rather a murderer be released unto us. And they took Jesus and they stripped Him of His clothes and they tied Him to a post and they beat Him and they beat Him. And, and V.E. Black used to know, be known for saying in his sermons that Historically, it can be viewed as that they beat the back of our Lord so severely that His flesh would have looked like human confetti. That sometimes the internal organs would be exposed to the outer world. The beating was so severe. And many strong men did not survive the beating alone. And someone may say, Preacher, why go into that gory detail? Well, why talk about that? Well, by the way, the Bible discusses that and it directs us toward the death of Jesus as, as a sign of the love that God has demonstrated unto us. That grace that Jesus extends, that, that free gift that is offered, it is offered to everyone, Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, and certainly that is true. But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, when I think of the grace of God, it is not setting sitting down on a porch, in the shade, taking it easy, living the way I want to, and just letting God's grace cover everything. No, it is in the Bible, grace is something that is extended, but grace is something that I need to reach out and, and accept. Just because someone offers me a gift doesn't mean I've necessarily accepted the gift. And unless I reach out and accept the grace of God, I cannot benefit from from the things that it brings like salvation. And so salvation 
is also talked about in verse number 10 of this same chapter, 2 Timothy 2. Verse number 10, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain, underline it, the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Redemption is only found in Christ. Grace can only be found in Christ. Salvation, which literally can be translated deliverance or having been rescued from imprisonment. As we've said before, I believe, just as God through Moses delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, so God through His Son Jesus Christ gives us the option of being rescued from sin today. But it's only found where? Where is it found? In Christ. Now let me go back a, a, a point and just say this. That in Romans chapter 8 in verse number 1, again we could look at dozens upon dozens, but you see this circle won't hold that many. In Romans 8 in verse number 1, the Bible tells us a third thing for our consideration. Actually, uh, another thing for our consideration, something that's only found in Christ. And in Romans 8 in verse number 1, the Bible says, There is therefore now, underline this two-letter word, it's so important, there is no... There is no condemnation to those who are, underline it, in Christ Jesus. And I think sometimes as Christians we need to hear this. Oftentimes we, we live the Christian life, we walk the Christian path, constantly scared out of our minds, thinking, well, I didn't pray before my breakfast this morning. I, I didn't teach that person at the gas station the gospel. I think I, I committed a sin earlier today and I, it's been three hours and I still haven't prayed over it. Brethren, I've got to tell you that if you read your Bible cover to cover, especially the book of 1 John, that is not the, that is not the dark and gloominess of a Christian life. The Christian life should be one of hope. The Christian life should be one of great joy. And when I read this passage, I learn, and by the way, we'll talk about these details in just a moment. We're not talking about, well, as long as I'm perfect, then I know I'm going to heaven. No. Or some people say, as long as I'm, as, as long as I'm committing no sin, then I think I'm going to heaven. I remember becoming a Christian at the age of 15, and I was on fire for the Lord. I obeyed the gospel in May, and I preached my first sermon in June. I was on fire for the Lord. But I remember for years and years and years laboring under this false information or false impression that if I even stumble or accidentally slip up once, unless I hurry and pray, then I'm going to be lost. Go and read 1 John. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 7, the Bible says on that occasion, and just so we can read it for ourselves, you might want to turn there. But in 1 John 1 and verse number 7, the Bible says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, read it with me, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, underline it, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sins. Here's a few observations. Number one, the only way I can have the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse me is if I'm walking where? Walking in the light. I cannot expect to be saved or forgiven or washed or clean if I'm walking in darkness. That's, that's the condition. But what does it mean to walk in the light? For years I thought walking in the light meant that, that I have to be nearly perfect. But notice in, in 1 John 1 and verse number 7, he says it is, it, it is possible to walk in the light and still be guilty of sins. Do you notice that? He's not encouraging sinfulness. He's not saying stop trying. But he says that our sins will be washed or cleansed if we're walking in the light. That makes me face the reality that I may be imperfect and I may commit sin, but I still may be on the path of light. And there is a difference. We can talk about that in future studies. But here's what I think needs to also be pointed out from 1 John 1, 7. I'm preaching from the New King James, and I do almost on all occasions. And 
there is still some use to that old King James Bible. Let me tell you what the old King James Bible offers that no modern translation offers, and that is the ETH at the end of words. Now that ETH is not so, so fun when we're having conversation. Uh, let's go with to the store. That's not the way we talk, right? But that ETH is the only way in the English language that's been invented up until this point that shows what the Greek language so clearly demonstrates, and that is continuous action. And so in the Bible, when it says in 1 John 1 verse number 7, that if we walk in the light, in the old King James, that should be walketh in the light. We can't just say, I was baptized in 1973, but I've not been faithful ever since, therefore I expect that forgiveness in 2020. As long as we are continuing to walk in the light, then this blessing is extended unto us. And by the way, when you get down to the word cleanse, in the old King James, it is cleanseth us from all sins. That means that if we're walking in the light, there is a continual cleansing that takes place. Here's the way I look at it. That when I'm driving down the road on a rainy day, and by the way, there's a lot of rainy days in Florida, isn't there? And I enjoy that because it helps lower those temperatures, it seems. When I'm driving down the road and it begins to rain, and, and I'm somewhat stubborn in this regard, I'll let that rain fall and fall and fall and fall, and finally Kim looks over and says, are you going to turn on those windshield wipers? Well, when I turn on those windshield wipers, what's it doing? It's wiping away every drop of rain. And before I have a chance to even acknowledge each drop, that wiper is wiping, wiping it away. Before I have the opportunity to count how many drops are on the windshield, that windshield wiper is continually making my vision clean. And that's what, I, that, that's what we understand from 1 John 1 and verse number 7. And almost in every chapter of that same book, that we as Christians have no need to fret. We as Christians have no need to live in constant fear and in worry. We can have that blessed assurance that though I am imperfect and though I stumble and though I make mistakes, before I can even acknowledge that I've made a mistake, if I'm walking in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanseth me from all sins. And if I acknowledge that, then a faithful child of God is going to have a penitent heart and be sorry over that. It leads them to repent and they go to God in prayer and say, Lord, please forgive me. But brothers and sisters, as long as I am in Christ, there is no condemnation. I can choose to leave that circle of safety. I can choose to leave it all behind. I can choose to give up all of these blessings and walk away. But as long as I am in Christ, my enemies cannot rip me from the hands of God. Satan himself cannot take me from the safety of Christ. As long as I am in Christ, I have redemption. I'm bought back from the devil. As long as I'm in Christ, I have the grace of God extended unto me and the benefits of that grace, salvation, applied to me. As long as I am in Christ, there is nothing to fear because hell itself cannot defeat me as long as I am in Christ. But let me add the qualifier may I not so quickly give up that relationship because in doing so, I've also walked away from all of the blessings. It looks like here's a third Sunday in the row where you're going to get a two-parter. Maybe that's something that, that God intended. Maybe it isn't. I want you to notice my artwork here. I didn't draw it, but you notice something about that stick figure. There's two things that I want you to notice about that man, first of which is that he's not in Christ, is he? He's on the outside of that circle. And because he's not in Christ, he is not a smiling stick figure. He is a sad, weeping stick figure. Now, the reason for that is because of this reality here that we've already acknowledged, and that is Isaiah 59, verse number 2. And there the Bible says that my iniquities have separated me from God so much so that He turns His face from me. And here's the reality. I need to be in Christ because that's where all spiritual blessings are found. I need to be in Christ because that's where redemption and grace and salvation are found. I need to be in Christ because only there am I safe from the condemnation of eternal hell. But because I may not be in Christ, 
But because of my sins, I may not be in Christ. Therefore, I am hopeless, hopelessly lost because of my sin. Now, I'm going to go ahead and briefly preview this point. We'll talk about it in more points later this evening. But brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, how can I go from that poor pitiful state of being outside of Christ to getting in Christ? How can I go from being separated from the grace of God to, to being a recipient of the benefits of God's grace along with salvation and redemption? Well, it's simple. Go with me in your Bibles. We're already in Romans. Go with me in your Bibles to Romans 6 beginning at verse number 1. We'll talk about this more fully this evening, but I could not end the lesson this morning without reading this passage. Read it with me, please. How can I be in Christ? Get in Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. Romans 6 verse number 1, Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. God forbid such a way of thinking. He says, how shall we who underline it died to sin? That's what I'm interested in. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Verse 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were underline it baptized into who? Into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into His death, verse 4. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And so in so many words, by the way, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 says, that whether Jew or, uh, or, whether Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, we have all been baptized into one body. And so I suggest to you, that if you this morning are outside of Christ, I love you enough to say, as long as we are outside of Christ, we cannot receive the redemption, the grace, or the salvation of God. And the reason I do what I do, and the reason our elders lead, and, and the reason our church does the work that we do, is to see that souls will go from being outside of Christ to being in Christ. And according to God's Word, we do that by being baptized into Christ. We're going to talk about more details this evening. But if you're here this morning and want to begin that relationship by getting in Christ where all spiritual blessings are found, we encourage you to do just that today with faith, repentance, confession, and baptism as we stand and as we sing.